Good morning. We're glad you all can be here today. Um, we are going to continue our study in the life of Christ. We're going to be uh, primarily in Matthew chapter 5 today, uh, in verses uh, 13 and following. So if you want to go ahead and open up your Bible to there, that's where we will be. Um, there are some sheets going around right now. Brother Gary's helping us pass those uh, out. Had a great study last week with Mr. Ron on the Beatitudes. Uh, I was not able to be here, but I heard it was uh, very, very good. And so we, we coming off the Beatitudes, hopefully we're in the uh, right frame of mind for the rest of this chapter because the Beatitudes really kind of help kind of set this tone uh, as we kind of come through the rest of this, uh, this sermon, this lesson uh, that Jesus is teaching. Um, he is teaching his uh, disciples. He is helping them to under. Uh, to understand that they have come to him uh, and they're trying to get understanding, they're trying to get clarity on some things. He teaches them, as we talked about last week, uh, how to be blessed. Uh, and the way he teaches them is in ways that maybe they had never thought of before. Uh, they may have never thought of being, uh, in order to be blessed, you have to be poor in spirit uh, and so many other things. And they maybe never thought about the fact that in order to be truly blessed, you have to mourn. Uh, that might not have ever crossed their mind um, they might not have ever thought about the fact that in order to be blessed, uh, you're probably going to be persecuted. Uh, if you're living the, uh, the right kind of life, you're going to face some type of persecution uh, because of the way uh, that the world or way, the way that sinful, uh, sinful man uh, reacts to the word of God. And so you, coming off that, you're going to see a contrast between God's people and worldliness. Uh, and really the rest of the world, any, any person that is outside of Christ, you're going to see a contrast. Now, I know that we have friends, we have family members that they, it's based on the world standards, they're, they're relatively good people. They, you know, they're hospitable. Uh, they do good things. They serve in various ways. Uh, and so um, they're doing all kinds of great things. But in order to receive these blessings that we're talking about and truly be blessed in the way that Jesus is referring to here, we have to uh, come into Christ, and, and that's where all uh, true uh, spiritual blessings reside. And so we're going to see a contrast as we look at God's people versus the rest of the world. And so we come to Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13, and it says, You are the salt of the earth. Now we're going to pause there because I want to talk about salt for a minute. If you eat any of my cooking... I promise you it's going to have some salt in it. Uh, if I, I know I'm a big guy, so I eat about everything. But, you know, if, if I have to pick a snack, whether it's salty or sweet, I'm picking salty every time. Now, that probably is the reason I have high blood pressure, too. So it might, might should work on that. But um, I just prefer salty snacks. Now, my wife, she's a baker. She likes sweets, okay, which means we always have salty and sweet uh, in my home. Salt. Salt is, in my opinion, is good. It's necessary. And in fact, uh, if I eat something that doesn't have enough salt in it, I will be re reaching very quickly for the salt shaker to make sure that plenty of salt is added to the food. But salt is not just for food. It's not just for seasoning, even though that is a, 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 one of the main purposes of salt. Salt also uh, has the ability to create uh, thirst. Okay, so if you take, take in salt, it actually helps create thirst. It helps create this longing for, uh, you know, uh, for, for liquid, for some type of drink uh, to help quench that thirst. Salt is used, uh, we don't experience this a lot in the South, but salt is used when there is ice on the roads. Uh, to, actually, they, they help prepare the roads before the snow and ice come so that they're ready for the kind of conditions. So salt is used in that way. Uh, salt in, in Scripture uh, would, be, would be used as a symbol for purity, uh, as, a, as, a, as a symbol uh, of helping to, to purify things. Uh, salt uh, was used, as we see in Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13, uh, was used in some sacrifices of the Jews, that you would have salt uh, represented there. Salt is a preservative. Uh, I know that especially my generation, uh, we're spoiled. Uh, we have always had uh, ref refrigeration and freezers uh, and deep freezes and coolers and all kinds of things that you can just, 
you know, take your meat and don't have to worry about it. But there was a day uh, uh, in times past where that was not the case. In the Jewish day, that was exactly the case that they had to make sure their meat was going to last, was going to last more than a day or two, uh, especially in, in, in hot circumstances, that they were going to preserve this meat. And so they would use salt as a preservative. Uh, and even today, there are still a lot of people that do uh, have houses where they have salted their meat and they're hanging their meat up uh, to uh, be preserved uh, in this kind of way. And so you see, there's a lot of usefulness in salt. This salt is very useful. And so we read this part of this verse again, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. See, here's the thing about salt. Salt has a purpose. It has usefulness. And so we're going to take salt and apply it to us if we have lost our saltiness, if we have lost our usefulness, which mean, the only reason, way we lose our use, usefulness is that we are not living for him. We are not doing the things that we ought to be doing. We're not studying. We're not living. We're not teaching. We're not preaching. We're not doing those kind of things that God has called us to do. We lose our saltiness. We lose that. Now, our saltiness, it says you are the salt of the earth. Our saltiness is represented there in the earth. It is represented there to the world. You're the salt of the earth. We are what brings flavor to the world. We are what brings that seasoning. We are what uh, helps uh, to bring uh, that thirst for God, that thirst for his people, that thirst for a different way of living. Do we recognize the fact that if we are living the salt light life that is described here, that people will not only want to live like us, they will also want to live as God has called them, which is the, I mean, the more important thing. They will want, to, they will crave and desire, they will need. You know, in, in John chapter four, Jesus talked about that, that, that living water, uh, that water, and that, that woman, she wanted it so badly, right? She wanted that water. That is what living a salt light life can do if we will truly live for God. They'll want that living water. They'll thirst for it. They'll long for it. And that is what uh, they want. So we need to continue the path and continue to be useful, but not just useful, continue to be uh, prosperous and grow uh, in, our, um, in our flavor, uh, in our example, uh, in our lifestyle towards God. One of the ways we grow is in our purity, is maintaining a pure life before God and before man. Maintaining that, that internal purity uh, that would consist of things that people don't know about us, that people don't know that we struggle with, that people don't know that it's part of our sin life. Maintain that outward purity that people do see, that people can witness, uh, that people can experience uh, as part of our life. We need to maintain that purity to the point that we are living sacrifices, as we read about in Romans chapter, one, or chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. We're to be holy. We're to be those living sacrifices. We're to have transformed and, re and renewed lives and minds. Those are the, that's the kind of way that we are to live, and that's the kind of way that we will we'll give the best example of living this salt-like, life-like, life. I can't even speak. Like life. There we go. I got it. Um, so Christians are the salt of the earth. And this is one thing I want us to mention before we move on from this uh, verse here. Is I think an important thing for us to tell ourselves or to remind ourselves is to not sell ourselves short. We all have purpose. And we all have work to do. We are the salt of the earth, which means that we have the ability to enhance, to help, to preserve, to, to bring people towards Christ if we would just live for him. Salt is a very simple thing. It's everywhere on our earth. But as far as being the salt of the earth that Christ talks about, this is a very special salt. It's the salt that the world needs. It's the salt that God has blessed us to be, uh, and we need to live it out every day. Now, going on, on from this, salt of the earth, now we're going to the light of the world. Uh, verses 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden, 
nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father uh, in heaven. Um, we are light because of our connection with the source of light, that being God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. We are the light of the world. Once again, it says salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are what helps bring light to the world. But how do we do that? Well, we do that because we are imitating Christ, because we are reflecting Christ, because we are showing his light living in us. I think about the image of a lighthouse. A lighthouse has a, has a keeper that keeps this lighthouse, has a watchman that is there. And this job is to keep the light burning, making sure that this lighthouse does not burn out. Because if the light is off and it's a storm or it's dark and the, and the ships can't see, then what happens? They run into the shore. They run aground. Uh, they wreck into each other. All kinds of things uh, can happen that, that, that are bad. And so we think about that. What can we do to prevent sin from just growing more and more and more? Well, we can be the light. We can show the light. We can shine the light uh, out into the dark world. We can be that city that is set on a hill and recognize that our light cannot be hidden, which means that other people are not going to be able to put out our light. And the only person that puts out our light is us. We can put our own light out, but no one else is going to put our light out. Uh, and if we allow somebody to do that, we're, we're the ones making that, that conscious decision. Our light is something that we have because of Christ Jesus. And so we have the ability to shine that light out. And think about this. A city was set on a hill for a couple of reasons. One, uh, they didn't want to waste farmland. Uh, we read that in our, in our comment, commentaries. That they did not want to waste farmland, so they put a city up on the hill. So this way, the good farming land would be able to be able to, to plant and grow. That, and I think that makes common sense. But also, they set it on a hill for security, for defenses, making sure that they were safe. Uh, it is hard to fight a battle uphill. Uh, it's difficult. Um, and in fact, when we try to take sin on by ourselves, it's kind of like us fighting a battle uphill. Uh, when, we're, when we don't go to God, when we don't lean on our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we're fighting a battle uphill. And so here we're to be a city set up on the hill um, so that we're safe, so that we're, def so that we're being defended, so that we're not being wasteful, so that we're being useful for those around us, so that we can be seen. It's okay for people to see us. Now, we're not trying to be showy. We're not trying to be flashy. We're not trying to be boastful. In fact, our service is, is good when we serve when people can't see, when it's behind the scenes and no one sees and, you know, and um, my phone's ringing. I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, it's, that's the kind of service that we are to have. But as far as wanting people to see our Christian light, that's a light we want them to see. We want them to see our Christian light shine. And so when we think about that, we say, nor did they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, even in a room, even in a house, you put a light on a lampstand so that it can do what? So it can illuminate the room. A little light can illuminate the whole entire dark room, but also so the light can be seen. Uh, if you can see the light, it brings comfort. Uh, if you can see the light, it helps you do whatever task you're trying to perform. Uh, being able to be seen is a very important part of being the light. It says it gives light to all who are in the house. Okay, so if you're a city and you give light, you give light to all that is around. If you're a, a candle on a lampstand, you give light to all that is in the house. And so we are to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We do all that we do to glorify God. If we start covering up our lights and start hiding uh, away from who we are and shying away, uh, and maybe we do that out of fear, maybe we do that out of shame, maybe we do, do that out of a combination of things, then not only are we hiding our light, but we're not honoring God. We're not glorifying him. 
And so let's all think about that as we start to, as we live our lives this week, uh, and even as we begin this new year, that our lights are given to us for a purpose. And that purpose is to shine. That purpose is to live for him so that others can see, so others can come to the light and walk in the light as we are. So we are to, to be the light and give glory to God. We're going to move on now to another section here in this chapter, and this is verses 17 and 18, and talking about the law. And what you notice here in this sermon, in this lesson that's being given here, uh, he's going to cover multiple topics. And so we're kind of moving topic by topic today. Uh, but then we're talking about a little bit about the law here in verses 17 and 18. And he says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Jesus and his life fulfilled all that scripture had said. He was the Messiah and the old law was the tutor that brought us to Christ. We can read about that from Galatians 3, verses 24 and 25. See here, the old law had purpose and the old law had, had a reason that it was there. And the old law was to lead us to Christ. And when Christ came, he fulfilled all things uh, and his death, burial, and resurrection, his, his, his entirety of his life fulfilled all that, that was written about before, that was talked about before, that was prophesied before, that was said about Jesus, that was said about the Messiah, that was said about salvation, that was said about God's people. All of these things, Christ came and he fulfilled it. The law was useful. The law was, was good. The law did not provide for salvation. The law did not uh, bring them into uh, Christ as the, the new covenant does. The law was that tutor, was that tutor that brought us, that brought people to Christ. And so we think about this, that Jesus came to fulfill the law. The law, when it was uh, fulfilled was essentially nailed to the cross. It, it, was, it was finished. Uh, it was completed. Uh, it was no longer the authoritative power uh, in the, the realm of man. That now the new covenant, the new law uh, in Christ uh, was that uh, new system of, 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 of governing uh, in regard to our spirituality, in regard to our spiritual lives. We read about that, uh, be it old law, be it known to the cross, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. So during Christ's life and ministry, the old law was the law, and it was uh, still in force. And I want us to, to think about that, that while Christ is saying this here in this sermon, the, the law of the land was still the law of Moses, was still the old law. And so Jesus honored the old law while he was alive. Now, he had to bring clarity uh, to the people because they had misinterpreted, they had abused, they had not uh, properly applied the old law. And so there are things that Jesus did that, that he, the Pharisees and other groups thought he was going against the old law, but Jesus did not break the old law. Jesus fulfilled the old law. Uh, he fulfilled things. And so he brought a clarity about the old law uh, and he brought a fulfillment to the old law. And so th those are things we need to recognize about this that he's trying to let them understand that right then and there while he's preaching this lesson, they're still under the old law, but there was a new law coming. Uh, and that new law was going to be uh, in him. So not one part of the old law would change until all was fulfilled. And so we need to uh, remember that and understand that, uh, especially in the context of this sermon uh, that Jesus was giving. Verses 19 and 20. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called the great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think that this comes off these previous verses that here he has told us not one jot, not one tittle is going to change until all things are fulfilled. And so he follows it right that back up by telling us that whoever breaks even one of the least of these things, that they're going to be guilty. Whoever breaks one of these things and is teaching one thing but practicing another, which that sounds pretty hypocritical uh, uh, to me, 
But whoever does these kind of things is going to be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches and basically practices of these things, he should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus brings attention to keeping the whole law, not just uh, part of it. Uh, teachers that do not practice what they teach, uh, like we said before, are going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. And I want us to think about that in connection with a later passage in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verses 27 and 28, talking uh, to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I think this verse just helps us to kind of understand this idea of those that are teaching one thing, but inside are practicing something else, or maybe even outwardly are practicing something else. Um, Notice this, that whoever this is, whether it's scribes, Pharisees, as he calls them, hypocrites, or whether it's even us today, if we are not truthful even to God's new law, then we're not going to enter into uh, you know, that eternity with him. Here he talks about that for these, they will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so we need to understand that righteousness, uh, it was very important to Jesus, very important uh, to our life. Uh, and if we want to be found righteous before him, then we need to be doers of his law uh, and teachers as well. Moving on to verses 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, but whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, here we have kind of the old way of thinking in the Old Testament uh, talking about murder. But Jesus is going to bring something to light that it's not just murder that's the problem. Murder is a problem, and Jesus doesn't say that it's not. But he goes deeper to this because he goes to the root of the problem. He goes to something that we all have and that we all at times struggle with, and that's matters of the heart. Uh, you know, several quarters back, we had an entire quarter talking about the heart. Um, here, he gets down to the root of the problem. And so we, we get back to things like anger, uh, to uh, yelling out things that are in, insulting, uh, that, are, that are verbal insults or maybe even verbal abuse, uh, that it, things that are not appropriate, that are not um, warranted. Um, Jesus wants to focus on those things. And he wants to show the severity of punishment that even comes to those type of things, not just murder. Murder is obviously uh, going to receive its own punishment, but Jesus wants us to pay attention to the heart of the matter, which being the matters of the heart. Uh, it's not just about killing someone. It's important how we treat other people on a daily basis. It's important uh, that we're not angry for just no reason, that when, when we are angry, that it's righteous anger, that we're angry for a just cause, uh, and we even, but that anger is still controlled. That anger does not lead to wrath and other outbursts of, of additional anger, that we're not hateful, that we're not judgmental. Um, Jesus is trying to teach us how to have a heart like him, how to have a heart like Christ. Uh, and so he's, he's showing this uh, as an example in this lesson of using murder as kind of the big thing that everybody thinks about, but then showing how anger and hateful insults and harsh words and judgments, how those things are wrong too, uh, and, and what kind of uh, punishment will come uh, from these things. Uh, we're going to see him do this again in a moment with adultery. He does the same kind of thing that he, he just did with murder. He'll do here with adultery here in a moment. But before we get there, verses 23 through 26, it says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And un- this is from Wayne Jackson's commentary. Uh, an unresolved legitimate offense against a brother 
nullifies one's worship. And I think that's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, we gather here on the first day of the week as, as commanded by, by God to worship. Um, at the very least, on a weekly basis, we need to be examining our lives and our relationships. Now, really, I think it's a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. I, th I don't think we need to wait all week long before we wait till Saturday night to try to get things right. But constantly, we need to make sure that we are right with God, with our brothers and sisters, with just people in general. Make sure that we're in a right place. And, and with the world, sometimes that's not going to be easy uh, because the world doesn't see things necessarily the way God and his people are to see. But there's a, to be a reconciliation. We're not to let things drag on and hang over us. We're not to let another person come between us and God, us and our worship. If we are so self-absorbed that we're going to let an argument, a disagreement, a, even, even something that was, that was wrong, that was done towards us, let it get in the way of our worship, then we're putting the focus all in the wrong places. We're focusing on ourselves and what we want and how we feel and how, you know, how we were wrong and how, how we were wronged. Uh, and we're not focusing on what's right. We're not focusing on things that, that God wants to. Yes, if someone has treated us wrongly, has sinned against us, we are to go to them. And we're to rectify that and we're to make sure that we're, we're once again reconciled to be with each other and that we're in the right place with one another. Uh, we're not to let any type of unresolved issue get in the way of us and God, us and our worship, or anything, anything of the sort. Um, this was also by Wayne Jackson. It says, the longer discord festers, the more difficult it becomes to heal. I've heard this numerous times from people um, where they just say, well, I just can't worship there anymore. And, and I'm not going to say there's not circumstances where that's probably better to worship someplace else. That, that, I'm not saying that's, there's, that there are circumstances that are like that. Um, but when it's a problem that is more easily solvable, uh, more easily discussed and um, you know, rectified, we need to put the effort in to rectifying those problems and to do so quickly. Um, to not hurt any soul, to not make anything last longer than it, than it already has, and to make sure that we're in the right place with God. We have to be humble in, the, in this mindset. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, it's not going to taste very good. We talked about salt early on. It's not going to taste very good when we have to humble ourselves. But it's the right thing to do. It's what God has called us to do. That doesn't mean we're just letting people run over us or anything like that. That's not what we're suggesting. What we're suggesting is that we put God and his kingdom and in the church, we put him first uh, over all of our petty differences uh, and that we do not let these things just fester and grow, that we take care of these problems um, and so they do not grow because we talk about till you have paid the last penny. Um, you think about the, the idea of a debtor's prison, <laughs> uh, if you're in jail, it's kind of hard to work, kind of hard to make money. Um, now, I know that, that maybe they equate every day of, you know, imprisonment as so much money uh, goes to your account. Uh, but if you are in prison, you can't work. If we are enslaved to this type of mentality, then the payment we're going to ultimately pay is we're going to miss out on heaven. And we're going to pay the eternal judgment of hell because we have not gotten our life right uh, before God and before man. Um, and so whatever, however, whatever severity you're talking about of payment, of judgment, um, it can get very severe. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we are reconciled to God and to our brethren. Moving on now to verses 27 through 30. This is another topic that is brought up within this chapter, and this is talking about uh, adultery in the heart. You have, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks 
at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. Adultery is a sexual uh, violation of a legitimate marriage. That's, that was one definition that I found. Adultery is, is, sex, out, is sex outside of a, your, your marriage union. If you're married and you have a sexual relations outside of your marriage union or your sexual relations with someone that is married, uh, I guess would be um, another way of saying it. But the sexual violation of a legitimate marriage union um, is a way of us describing adultery. But this goes, once again, just like murder, gets more to the heart of the matter. It, it, it goes down into, but what about lust? What about longful looks? What about all those type of things where we are um, fantasizing, where we are making suggestive comments, where we are... Um, I mean, just having thoughts in our mind that are not appropriate towards a person uh, that is not our spouse. Um, I, I wish I could just say towards, you know, the opposite sex, but unfortunately, th th that's not the case uh, in our world today, that people have all kinds of thoughts towards all kinds of people. Uh, but having inappropriate thoughts or, and fantasies that is not in connection, or that it, it's not your spouse. It's not about your spouse. Um, those kind of thoughts and those kind of looks and those kind of longing desires, they're sinful. And as it calls it here, it says that this is adultery in the heart. Has already committed adultery uh, with them in the heart. And so here within this text, it doesn't just call out the sin. It does that. It calls out the adultery in the heart. It calls out adultery in and of itself. But it takes the time within this text to say longing looks, lust, adultery are all sinful. But then it tells us things we can do to combat those things. Um, now, I do not necessarily know that you need to go out, what's it say, pluck out your eye and cut off your hand. Uh, um, I, you know, but these are, two good, these are two examples here that are given. This is the severity of what sin does to us. And as it says here within the, in the text, it would, it would be better to lose one of your members as like the eye or the hand than to be cast into hell. The, really the message here is to be combative against these type of desires and these type of sin. We do things in order to, to put um, this sin away and to make sure that it's not part of us. I knew uh, a, a gentleman, uh, he was uh, very well respected, and he had a problem with uh, pornography. That was one of his problems. And so, what did he have to do? Well, he had to, you know, keep his spouse informed of all of his accounts and passwords and things like that. He had to make sure that his phone and tablet and things like that were locked away when, uh, when his spouse wasn't around and he had to just do other preventative things like that to make sure that there was no mistrust, there was that, that trust could grow back uh, once again. And there had to be preventative things put in place to help him combat a problem that he had. And to the best of my knowledge, he eventually conquered it um, through the help of his wife and other people. And that's one of the things we're talking about here is it would be better to lose your phone access, your computer access. It'd be better to go to uh, paper books and handwritten notes uh, than it would be to burn in hell because you were addicted to things like pornography or other type of things that cause us to lust uh, and to have longing looks. And so uh, we need to understand the sinfulness of adultery, the sinfulness of lust, the sinfulness of those longing looks. We also need to recognize the, the, the honor and respect we're to have within a marriage and just how God 
has looked and how he has thought about marriage. Verse 31 and 32, it says, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of a divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any, any reason except sexual immorality causes her to, to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Um, sin, especially there in the Old Testament, uh, but even, even now, just sin in general, plays a huge role uh, in the decline of the ideal marriage. And when I say ideal marriage, I mean the God-approved marriage. Um, and sin gets in the way. Even in the life there of the Jews, that they would, uh, through, the, through Moses and, the, and there with the giving of the law and the way the, the Jewish people lived, they allowed for certificates of divorcement to be given uh, in that time period. The, Moses and them allowed that to happen. Uh, and in fact, it was for more than the reasons that's given here within this text. The reason given here in this text was sexual immorality. But certificates of divorcement could be given for other reasons uh, uh, under the way that they were, they were practicing the, the, uh, the law. And so that was sin creeping in. That was sin entering in their life. They were doing things that were not what God intended. And so here, God, he's going he's gonna to kind of set the record straight. He's going to kind of help them understand what was desired by God for marriage, what was desired by God, uh, and the only exception to the rule. Uh, the rule is the man and woman are to be married forever. Notice, man and woman are to be married forever. That's, that's, that's kind of the rule. Uh, Colin gets up here with the young kids, and he says, one man, one woman for life, I believe is the way he phrases that. And that's what God intended. That's the understood rule. And so when we look here within this, he gives an exception, sexual immorality, but he is, that kind of eliminates all the other things. It eliminates the, well, we just had uh, was it irreconcilable differences. Is that what the, the, the phrase is? Um, you know, we just, we just had differences of opinion. We just couldn't live together. We just, uh, he kept leaving his socks on the floor or, you know, she kept burning the toast or whatever. It, it don't matter. You know, certificates of divorce were serious things. And the only reason that God gave approval for divorce was sexual morality. And here within this text, he says that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. This is talking about a marriage relationship that you break up for any reason other than sexual immorality. You cause the other one to commit adultery. That you are leading them either into it. There's multiple ways this, po this could possibly be so. Either you're tempting them, you're separated from them, uh, as you talk about uh, over in Corinthians, uh, uh, whatever way this is necessarily talking about, you are causing them to, uh, causing her in this text uh, to commit adultery. It says, whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. When you turn over to passages in Matthew chapter 19 uh, in verses three through nine, we see once again, the full discussion there of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And we don't have a lot of time today to really read all of that. But as we look here within this text, what we see is that the only way that you should ever even contemplate a divorce, and I say contemplate, I don't say go through with it, would be for sexual morality. Okay, that's the, the God-approved uh, thing that's possible. Now, there are couples that have conquered this, by the way and have moved past this. So I'm not saying that that's always what you need to do. But this is what God, God has approved. But in the, in the, in the realm of, of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, unless your spouse has died, or unless you divorce for the right reason because of sexual immorality, the idea of remarriage um, would not be permissible. Only if your spouse has cheated on you and do you divorce for that reason, can you, according to the text, be remarried? Uh, unless you, you're, like you said, you're, you, uh, you, were, you were married to someone that has passed away uh, and then you're not necessarily getting remarried. You're just marrying, you're marrying again. You're marrying someone new. Um, and so this might be hard to hear and that may be hard to understand, 
Uh, you're not the only ones. The Matthew chapter 19, verse 10, uh, even his followers were a little taken back by it there for a moment. Uh, they said, well, maybe it's, maybe it's just good not to marry then. And, you know, for some, it might be. For some that can't live according to that rule, it might be better to not to marry. Now, for all of us that are married, I think we would all agree uh, that marriage is a wonderful thing, uh, has been helpful to our lives, but we just need to see the serious nature that God has put on marriage and the, commit, the lifelong commitment that marriage is uh, to our lives. We only have a couple more minutes, so we're going to read these, this text uh, quickly and then kind of cover it. Uh, verses 33 and following. Again, you have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, uh, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your, by your head, because you cannot make one hair uh, white or black, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. We are to be honest people, uh, and we are to be reliable. Um, we are to not make oaths, as it said, according to these things that we have no control of anyway. God is the one in control. He is the one that is ruling. He is the one that is, um, that is in charge. We are to simply state the truth, be truthful. Say yes and yes, or no, no. We're to be careful what we say and the promises that we make, for we don't have control over our life. James 4, and verse 15. So in, in that, we are to talk about our promises and our oaths, and we are to do things all in accordance to the will of, of, of God. James chapter 5 and verse 12, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. We are going to be held accountable to the oaths that we make and, in, and the promises that we make. Um, we need to let our word stand for itself and let our word be simple and spoken and in accordance to the will of God. Verse 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, uh, tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you in the right cheek, turn to the other also, um, or turn to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, take uh, and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants uh, to borrow from you, do not turn away. Um, the, the old law uh, allowed for a form of retaliation, an eye for an eye uh, type mentality. Um, Jesus wants us to show kindness, um, to, even to those that harm us, even to those that abuse us. He wants us to, to rise above uh, all of these things and, and, to, and to show the type of uh, meekness that he showed uh, in his life. Uh, the commandment is not to give away all that you have, but to instead to use this kindness and to use this way of living to help combat this evil uh, that is around. Romans 12, verses 17 through 21. Um, we use this, and as there in Romans, it talks about heaping coals upon their head. Uh, that's the kind of lifestyle that we are to have. Really, this text here in Matthew talks about us going the second mile. And here's the thing, when you go to the second mile, you have an opportunity to save a soul. Uh, you have an opportunity to be a good example towards them. And so we do this because why? Because we love our enemies. And that's the reason that we, at least that's the way we should act. Uh, verses 43 and following uh, talks, says, you have heard it said, you shall love your uh, neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he who makes the sun rise, uh, uh, rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do, do so. Therefore, you should be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. God loves the world, even us, the sinner. We are to be dedicated to the eternal welfare of all people. We are to love in the way that God has loved us. We are to do good to those that are enemies, do good to those that hate us. Uh, notice as you come to the text, you know, we are to love, we are to bless, we are to do good, we are to pray, 
all of those action words that we are to do for even those that hate us and are considered our enemies. And so within this chapter, um, this sermon's not over yet, uh, but within this lesson, we see so many great lessons today. Uh, hope you've taken some of this in today. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can talk to me after class. And next week, we'll pick up with Matthew chapter 6.